All right, it is 1031, so we will get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to the Local Entrepreneur and Cultural Tourism Virtual Tour. Um, my name is Carrie Sherman, and I'm the Special Projects Coordinator here at Mount St. Vincent University in the Business and Tourism Department. Uh, today's tour hosts, we have Chef Trevor Penny from Birch and & Anchor and Justin Zink, the Retail and Events Manager at Garrison Brewing, joining us. Um, each of our hosts will have about 30 minutes to give a tour and answer some student questions. Uh, we have received questions from students in advance, but if any questions come up during the session, students are able to send myself a private message in your chat box. Just click message to host. Uh, please keep in mind that we have 30 minutes with each presenter and we may not have time to get to everyone's question. All right, that is all for me. Trevor, I will hand the reins to you. All right, thank you. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this virtual tour. Um, product of the times, I'm sure we're going to be talking a lot about COVID today and how everyone's dealing with it. Um, but before we get into that uh, unpleasant topic, um, as we said, my name is Trevor Penny. I'm the executive chef at Birch and Anchor, uh, originally from Toronto. I've been in Nova Scotia for uh, going on five years now. The first couple of which were spent at Cabot Links as chef de cuisine, uh, which my wife wasn't so fond of. Uh, so we've uh, settled on Halifax and I couldn't be happier. Um, a little brief history of what we've been doing at Birch and Anchor. Um, it actually started as a catering company uh, called Asado uh, in 2015. Um, and that was a focus on uh, barbecue at events. So I'm actually just flip the camera around and let you take a little peek at this. Um, so this little girl we affectionately called Dorothy. Um, as you can see, it hooks up to a truck uh, and this is a fully operational smoker. Um, so we would bring this to events, um, cater pig roasts, large cuts of meat, um, kind of, you know, whatever, whatever the party prefers, uh, weddings, parties, and festivals is kind of our tagline. Uh, we call her Dorothy because this one came from Kansas. Um, we brought her back and since then have had another one purpose built for us in Dartmouth. Um, it's a little bit larger. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of what we've been doing for the past five years is bringing one of these smokers uh, to your backyard, to your wedding venue, um, kind of wherever the party's at and uh, cooking up food that way. Um, so, as we said, five years of that, and we decided it was probably time to start up a brick and mortar. I joined Asado last year and have since helped kind of refine the offering, uh, scale things up a little bit, and kind of focus in on the business side and kind of create our vision. Um, since then, the beginning of this year, um, welcome to Birch and Anchor. Uh, it's a little leafy out here. Uh, we haven't been doing too much lawn maintenance recently as we have moved inside. So this is kind of the entrance to our di outdoor dining area. Um, it's a very laid back kind of atmosphere. Um, Adirondack chairs, got a fire pit uh, overlooking the beautiful Bedford Basin. Um, this part of the lawn also used to be full of more of those picnic tables, um, but we've since moved inside as the weather is becoming a little less predictable. Um, it's getting cooler at nights and whatnot, so we decided uh, it'd be a little more comfortable for everyone to move inside. Um, so the way that we originally conceptualized uh, the program here at Birch and Anchor was a concession style service. Um, so what we're approaching right now was the outdoor concession bar uh, in which you would originally walk up to this kind of you know, faux garage door kind of looking thing that folds up. You'd have a team of bartenders standing back there. Um, place your order. You'd get a table number, go to one of the picnic tables on the lawn, and then the servers would serve you there. We found it was a nice casual style service. It allowed us to kind of uh, manage our labor costs and, you know, keep staff to a minimum while also offering exceptional service to the guests. Um, we quickly realized that it wasn't necessarily the most COVID friendly practice. Um, so we pivoted into the table style service. And over that span of two weeks, we'll backtrack a little bit. With Asada, we had myself, Michael Yule, who is the owner, one other full-time prep cook, and a couple of part-time casual staff helping us out. Um, since we've transitioned into Birch and Anchor, we hired on approximately 12 more people to open the restaurant. And with the switch to table style service, our staff is now over 50. 
Um, so quite the change in the span of a year, um, which is, you know, left us terribly excited. We're able to provide a little bit more um, community job support that way, uh, as well as, you know, build the team that we have looking into the future of the company. Um, so this is the outdoor kitchen uh, that we've been operating out over the summer. Um, so this is a wood-fired pizza oven, lots of room to keep wood underneath there. Um, she's pretty big, again, probably a little dusty. I don't know how well you can see in there, but you can fit quite a few pizzas in there, uh, which is good because we sold a lot of them. <laughs> uh, this is the wood-fired grill uh, with a little rotisserie attachment. Um, so this little wheel here, you can turn and it raises the grill up and down. Um, and then we had a couple fridges out here that have since moved inside, uh, and that's kind of the pizza station. Um, also a vertical smoker in the back just for a little extra uh, smoke prep. Um, and then this was our little private dining area, just kind of a little bit more secluded from the, the rest of the property. Um, so you could come and have a, a smaller party with you know a group of 10 or 12 friends or whatnot. Um, so I think we'd be remiss if we didn't take one last look at the, the gorgeous view of the basin. And of course, everyone loves the smokestacks. We had a lot of selfie opportunities there over the summer season. Um, so those of you who are familiar with the space know that it used to be uh, known as Chinatown. Um, it remained closed for a number of years without too much interest from investors or you know people just wanting to do anything else down here. Um, so when we got the opportunity, we jumped on it. It was a lot of hard work. Um, myself, Michael, and our general manager, uh, Jennifer Swain, um, did a lot of the grunt work ourselves. Um, I take pride in the fact that all the fences you see, I put up with my own two hands and we laid a lot of the sod and all that kind of stuff. So it really was a labor of love. Uh, and we all worked together to get the place up and running uh, and something that we could be proud of. Um, so we'll now take a walk inside. If I can turn my camera around. Um, so these are kind of the main doors to enter the interior space. Uh, the first thing you'll see is the host stand, which is appropriate. <laughs> um, and yeah, so we moved all of these picnic tables inside for the winter season, um, did a little interior decorating. The space used to look very, very different. I tried to find some old photos, but uh, I think we were all too shell-shocked with the, the way the space was when we uh, inherited it. So <laughs> not too many photos were taken during that time. Um, so this is our service bar where we can make all sorts of nice fancy cocktails. And of course, like most places, behind the scenes isn't usually quite as pretty. <laughs> um, so this is kind of the back server section where we can make coffees and beverages. And we enter the kitchen. Um, so hot side production, uh, kind of the hot pass. See lots of pots and pans and stuff like that in the background. Um, dish pit through there. And then this is our cold sub kitchen. Um, really nothing too fancy, but it's, it's quite large and spacious and uh, we appreciate the space that we have. Still a little love to, to apply to get it uh, you know, where we want it, but as with everything, it's a work in progress and we'll never stop. Um, so that's kind of an overarching tour of the place. I'm gonna sit myself back outside and maybe switch the camera around to another view of the harbor while I answer some of the questions that you guys have had so far. Um, I did prepare a couple notes. So we'll go on that. Pardon me for a second here. Okay, so yeah, I mentioned that we uh, started out as a Sato. It's five years in. Um, we've opened up Birch and Anchor in kind of a bit of an odd time, uh, especially with the pandemic. Opening a new restaurant was quite a stressful endeavor. Um, but I think to our benefit, having this outdoor space with ample room for social distancing, um, when people are a little apprehensive to be in close spaces with you know, uh, numerous other people, uh, it kind of uh, benefited us in a strange way. Uh, and we've had a mammoth season. Uh, as I said, we took our staff from a meager three uh, to over 50 people. Obviously ebbing and flowing as the season has changed. Um, but I think it's important in, in any kind of, uh, especially in these times, tourism driven city like Halifax to be able to pivot really quickly on your feet and um, you know react to the, the changes that are happening around you 
and just be able to, uh, you know, keep gainful employment, keep your employees active and keep giving something back to the community. Um, so yeah, I mentioned we're inside now. We talked a lot about myself. Um, so one of the first uh, kind of questions that I have here from the notes previous um, are the challenges uh, that we're facing right now. Um, Mostly due to COVID. Sorry yep. to interrupt you. Um, your camera just turned off. Oh, well, that's no good. There we go. And we're back. Yeah, it's probably just because I was on a separate screen. Um, so, yeah, as, as I was mentioning, uh, we're talking about kind of the, some of the challenges that we're facing right now. Um, again, mostly caused by COVID. Um, and I think we're all kind of seeing it with, as we mentioned, uh, Halifax being uh, mostly tourist kind of economy. Um, obviously, no one's coming in on the cruise ships right now. Uh, so that's a bit of a challenge. Additionally, a lot of people are out of work um, because of, uh, you know, just just the situation at large. Um, disposable income is down. Uh, so people aren't necessarily dining out as much. Going out to dinner is kind of a treat. And if you don't have, you know, a flush bank account, it's probably not on your list of top priorities. So one of the ways that we're trying to kind of, again, pivot is uh, this weekend, we're starting up a winter market. Um, so we're inviting uh, a lot of our suppliers that supply us with food and uh, alcohol, as well as other local makers and creators in the city um, to come to the space, uh, set up some booths, we'll provide some hot beverages, um, and you know we can kind of create another one of those safe, distanced uh, outdoor experiences for people to still experience some of the things that they, you know, enjoy doing in, in more stable times um, with that level of comfort added. Um, so that'll kick off this weekend. In addition to our brunch menu, um, we're currently open inside for dinner, as I mentioned. Um, so those are some of the ways that we're trying to, you know, keep ourselves busy, keep the community engaged, um, and, uh, you know, just keep the ball rolling. Um, awesome, Trevor. Do you want to talk a little bit more about your locally sourced ingredients and, like, the vendors that you have coming to your market? Absolutely. So uh, one of our favorite local vendors, uh, Maritime Gourmet Mushrooms, um, is very likely going to set up shop. Uh, again, this is a, a lot of... Um, vendors that were previously occupying the Seaport Market, um, for whatever reason, are not uh, getting their spots back this year. So we're definitely trying to capitalize on that and get as many of them in because they've already got, you know, a nice uh, client base and obviously they're, they're doing really good product and uh, making people happy that way. So Maritime Gourmet Mushrooms is one of the ones that's going to come by for sure. Uh, we source all of our bread from Julian's Bakery and the Hydrostones. Um, so they are also interested in coming by. It's again, one of those challenges, like we want to get more people from the community involved, but on their side, their staff levels have dwindled. So they don't necessarily have the bodies to man these stalls. So we're in conversation about how we can, you know, help staff them and we'll have some verbiage prepared. So we're doing their products justice. Um, you know, so we can deliver the same experience they would if they were there in person. Um, as far as uh, this, this is our first weekend, um, <laughs> but I don't, I'm not handling most of the, the marketing for the market itself. Um, so I can certainly get back to you with a list of people that will be here uh, once I talk to uh, Michael Yuld. Um, but that's a good segue into another thing I wanted to talk about uh, with the industry at large. And this doesn't just apply to, to restaurants. I think it's a lot of uh, the tourism and hospitality industry at large. Um, for lack of a better word, it's, it's quite incestuous. So it's really important that we forge these uh, tight knit and long lasting relationships with our suppliers. Um, you know, if we don't get the product, we can't turn it into, you know, something that we can put on a plate and sell for money. Um, so we definitely want to support our local community. One hand washes the other uh, and they both wash the face as they say. So, um, you know, a lot of times when you start a new job, again, specifically in restaurants for this case, you're going to find cooks and servers that have worked with, numerous of your colleagues and you would have never really guessed it from the outside in um so it's really important obviously you know my motto is work hard and be nice to people we don't want to build bridges or <laughs> burn bridges sorry um yeah it's all about forging those those long-lasting relationships and 
you know, helping each other out in any way possible, whether through cross promotion or, um, you know, just if you're using someone's product on your menu, put it on your menu, a little shout out goes a long way. Um, and, uh, when it comes to wearing many hats, um, in addition to being the executive chef and taking care of, you know, the food and procurement, uh, you know, developmental training of the staff. Uh, I'm also extremely involved in our social media, um, which I think is another th trend in, in the hospitality industry. It may seem from the outside in like a behemoth. Um, you know, it's a massive property. We'll have lots of bums in seats. It's bustling. But at the end of the day, we're a pretty small team. Um, you know, it's, it's essentially a family run restaurant with Mike and his wife uh, kind of footing the bill and a small team of management helping to achieve those goals. Um, but yeah, certainly, you know, if, if a, a pipe breaks, I'm usually the first one they call. And if, if I'm not there, Jen will take care of it. Um, yeah, so it's important to be, you know, able to take on more than your necessarily prescribed duties and, you know, jump in to fill whatever role is needed at whatever time. And that's beyond COVID. That's just a reality of, of the industry at large. Um, so we talked a little bit about local sourcing. Um, so again, a lot of this is, is coming back to the fact that it is a tourist-based economy. Um, it's really important that the, we support the local entrepreneurs and the people who are opening the small businesses. Because at the end of the day, people aren't going to visit a location that they don't feel passionate about or is offering anything different than you know, the town they may live in. Um, so another great reason to support local entrepreneurs and um, kind of create that sense of community on the back end of things um, so that it, we can create a unified front for the, the people who are visiting our city and uh, you know investing their money and keeping the economy going, especially in these times. I'm realizing I probably should have spoke slower. Uh, <laughs> I've gone through most of my talking points now is probably a good opportunity to field some more questions if you've got any coming in there. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we talked a little bit about um, your locally sourced ingredients and materials. Um, and as you said, this is kind of like a family run restaurant, like the two owners started it. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about that like entrepreneurial spirit that happens at Bridge and Anchor? Yeah, so I mean, like most things, it's uh, it's a stressful endeavor to take on something new, especially when you're uncertain of the economic circumstances that surround it. And going from, it's kind of comical if you saw the kitchen that we've been operating out of, I mean, myself only for a year, but Mike for four years before that. Um, so when he started the business, he was literally the only employee with his wife helping him out and a couple of friends helping to serve uh, if and when they had the time. Uh, Michael's father owns uh, a business in uh, Burnside and in the back of that there's a very small kitchen with a double sink um, a commercial uh, like a home oven basically with the four coils and you know just the single door um, and a, a table or two um, so it's, it's really impressive when you look at what we've been able to build on the shoulders of that uh, small you know back of house restaurant um, and I mean, he's been doing, you know, parties of over 300 people um, multiple times a week um, for those four years. Um, so I, I guess what it really boils down to is it's, it's always worth taking the chance if you've got something you feel you can offer to the community and something, I mean, it doesn't even really have to be innovative or unique as long as you're doing it exceptionally well and there's a need for it. Um, I find speaking of the fact that I'm from Toronto, there's a lot of people from Ontario moving out of the province because the big hotspots like Toronto, for instance, are just becoming inundated with too many restaurants. Like there's, there's not really so much of a need for it anymore. Uh, not to mention that the, the housing prices are skyrocketing and all that kind of stuff. Hamilton is basically becoming Toronto 2.0. Um, so, I mean, Yes, you want to offer something that you're proud of, but maybe make sure that there's a niche for it. <laughs> um, yeah, because it's, it's always a big risk starting your own um, business, uh, opening a new restaurant, popping up a coffee shop, starting to grow microgreens, brewing beer, whatever the case may be. Um, but as long as you're passionate about it and you surround yourself with people you know, who will support you, 
uh, give back to the community as much as they give to you. Um, I think that's really what it's all about in building a community entrepreneurship kind of relationship. Absolutely, that's awesome. So as you said, your organization, like the company has grown so much over COVID and has really expanded. Do you find that even though you're growing larger that that entrepreneurial spirit still rings true throughout your company? Oh, 100%. Uh, we've always been of the mindset that, I mean, if you stop moving, you die, for lack of a better term, if you're not constantly pushing forward um, and seeing, you know, what, what's coming next. Um, stagnation is, you know, the devil when it comes to businesses of any sort. Um, it's, if, if you feel comfortable, something's probably wrong um, and it's going to be short-lived for the most part. Uh, you, you need to constantly strive People get bored, uh, especially in these times. If you're not, you know, flipping the script and keeping things fresh, um, you know, Garrison's a great example of, of how they're constantly doing community outreach, um, you know, working with big and small companies. We've had the pleasure of working with them many times in the past, hosting, you know, community festivals with the Asado brand. Um, and, you know, just, you know, getting your face out there, keeping people interested, working with other interested parties to, again, create that kind of, social buzz and um you know stay involved with the community and keep them involved with you as well um so definitely we have plans over the next couple of years um to, to open more restaurants event spaces um you know wedding venues uh maybe even a little airbnb type bed and breakfast uh kind of thing um but yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's good to dream big, but we obviously are going to do our due diligence and make sure the time and place is right and, you know, take it one step at a time. That's wonderful to hear about your awesome plans for the future. Um, so we have a question from a student. Um, what do you think that students need to be a successful entrepreneur or representative of the service industry? And what are you looking for in employees and team members in the future? So are there any advice for our students? Absolutely. I think I can answer both of those questions with, with one word. And of course I'll elaborate, but passion, um, passion is the utmost of importance. Um, I mean, I always say you can teach anyone to cook. They just have to want to learn. Um, and the more interested you are in something, we don't want anyone, especially here at Birch and Anchor to feel like they have to be here. We definitely want everyone to want to be here. Um, because if you're, you know, just trudging along, trying to pay a paycheck, uh, it's going to be reflective in the work that you do and the way that you interact with uh, your consumer base. Um, passion is extremely important. Um, and that's what keeps the ball rolling. Um, as I said, you can, you can teach, you know, you can basically teach anyone to do anything as long as they, they are interested in, and want to learn and want to put the work in. Um, Cause a lot of this work isn't necessarily easy. Um, but when you love it, it becomes very much so more easy. Um, it, it, I don't, loathe getting out of bed and coming to work in the morning. A, I've got a beautiful spot. I've got a great team. Um, you know, I try to only hire people that I don't mind hanging out with all day. Um, and, you know, just kind of creating that. It's like a micro community in, inside the community at large. Um, when you spend this many hours working with people on a weekly basis, they become your family. I, I see my sous chefs more than I see my wife. Uh, <laughs> Um, so it's, it's important that we all get along uh, together. And as we say, it's the, the constant training, constant development. If I'm not pushing myself, if I'm not pushing my team, then the ball's going to stop and we're going to stop growing. And, you know, the buzz will die down. People won't be excited anymore. And it's about creating that constant, um, you know, kind of buzz. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Sounds great. So you have another question from a student. Um, how are you dealing with the economical challenges in these times? Uh, yeah, so as I said, we were blessed to have, you know, a really bump in summer, um, way busier than we expected it to be. I guess the biggest struggle for us right now, especially after moving inside, is we hired on that, that massive crew. Um, and, you know, just even with our limited hours of operation, we used to be open from 11 to 11 every day. We're now closed on Mondays and Tuesdays, uh, and we're open for dinner service only. Um, so just with that change, we're having to either reduce a drastic number of our staff's working hours per week, or let some of them go, encourage them to find uh, other part-time work, which is not easy in these times for anyone to find gainful employment. Um, so I think that's the thing that hurt us 
the most. Um, because again, we, we want to try to strive for that family atmosphere and we want people to live and grow with the company. Um, but we're all just having to take it kind of even one day at a time, um, see what next month looks like, see what next week looks like, see what tomorrow looks like. Um, I find in a lot of uh, young businesses, it's really easy to have kind of knee jerk reactions. Um, oh, you know, this, this, this week was down, this quarter was down. We need to change something drastically. But I mean, we just got over Thanksgiving weekend, and you know, obviously restaurants aren't going to be very busy when everyone's eating with their families or going out of town or whatnot. Um, so it's important to always kind of, you know, take a deep breath and really uh, discuss with your team, look at the metrics, look at the trends, um, and kind of, you know, make an important decision with your head and not necessarily with your heart when it comes to those business uh, kind of aspects. Um, but yeah, honestly. With Birch and Anchor, we've been extremely blessed with an extremely busy summer. Um, where we're feeling the biggest hit is with Asado. Um, we, again, have the two barbecues that we take on the road, um, you know, catering parties of 200, 300 upwards. Um, not a lot of that happening this year uh, with, you know, group sizes being limited to, to mostly 50. Uh, we've done a handful of small backyard weddings, but Certainly, I, I'd say our, our profits went down by at least 90% on the Asado side this, this year. Um, so if it wasn't for Birch and Anchor, um, I might not be here right now uh, having this conversation with you guys. So we, we feel really, uh, really blessed that, you know, it was a profitable summer here uh, and the, the buzz is strong and we're looking forward to, uh, you know, getting over this, this COVID bump and, uh, you know, getting back on the road and, and hosting some big chiddicks. Awesome. Well, that's amazing. Thank you so much, Trevor. This has been so wonderful. Uh, we've loved hearing about Birch and Anchor. Um, if our students have any further questions, they can send them to me at business at msvu.ca and I will forward them to Trevor. Um, again, thank you so much. We've loved having you. It was, it was great. It's been an absolute pleasure. Awesome. All right. Now we are going to go over to Justin from Garrison Brewing. All right. Hi, Justin. Hey. All right. So Justin is the retail and events manager at Garrison Brewing. I'm just going to hand the reins over to you, Justin. Okay. Awesome. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our, if you haven't already been here, this is our Seaport location. We have two locations now, uh, one here in the heart of the Seaport uh, and then one on Oxford Street. Uh, and we just recently opened that last year in November. Uh, and then we had two to three bumping months and then COVID happened. So we had to pivot really quickly. So Trevor talked a lot about pivoting and like taking advantage of your financial circumstances. I totally agree. Uh, we went from being a primarily retail space to being an online store behemoth in like two weeks. So that was always fun. So yeah, you come into our space here. Uh, let me just get this on facing camera and you see what you see when you come in the front doors. It's our, since our, Organization has been open since 1997, and this is our original brew house. This is not our original location. Our original location was in uh, Lady on Lady Hammond Road. We outgrew it very quickly, and we moved down here uh, in the early 2000s, uh, taking advantage of before even the Seaport Farmers Market was here. And yeah, it was. It's been a lot of fun. So yeah, we, when you come into our space, this is what we've done. Uh, it looks very different than what it usually does pre-COVID. We used to have beer all lined up around here. Uh, much more public facing, but we've had to reduce the number of touch points in our space. So this is our retail desk. We, again, had to put up all this great barriers and stuff like that, but we moved very quickly to do that so we'd be able to accommodate people. Uh, and then we have our merch over here that's uh, usually very busy this time of year with cruise ship passengers. This is the height of what would be normally cruise ship season. Uh, and they love t-shirts, they love glassware, they love everything. Uh, and then we have a special section for apparel for crafty women, uh, their ladies cuts, and then our beer section. So all of the offerings we own, we have right now, we have our core brands over here with Tall Ship, Irish Shred, and Hoppy Boy. Uh, and then we have, we make our own soda, some specialty things, uh, and then all of our cans. Cans have become the number one purveyor, uh, how you get your beer, uh, conveyance device uh, over the last, you know, two or three years, it's become primarily how you get your beer. Uh, on the other side of the house is our hospitality side. So when I first started, 
uh, we were a beer store that occasionally did sampling. Uh, now we are a primarily a tap room that occasionally sells package product. Because when I first started, we had a wall right here, pure across, and we had a little ugly couch and a couple chairs. And so we changed that where we quickly came in and I quickly came, saw the opportunity to say, hey, we've got 10,000 people parked out front here for two months of the year. Uh, why don't we focus more on the beverage, the, the hospitality side, because it's something very unique to our location. So we expanded very quickly uh, our, our, our hospitality offering. So this is our hospitality side, obviously set up for COVID right now. We're just getting off uh, Oktoberfest here, as you can see with the flags and things. Uh, but yeah, this is our hospitality side. It's grown immensely. Uh, this footprint here is used to be where our bottling line was, uh, but now it's obviously our tap space. Um, and so yeah, there's our offerings uh, on tap right now. We have one empty spot, which I'm sure will be filled later today. And just like with Trevor, the back of house stuff is not that fancy. <laughs> it's, 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 it is what it is. It's utilitarian. It's glassware, primarily dishwasher. Uh, flight boards, those kind of things. Um, then inside we have our original brew house. We are a functioning brewery over here. There are beer in tanks and fermenting and going on well. Uh, so we have our mash tun. I'll take you folks through quickly through the beer production side of things. So first off we have the mash tun. The mash tun is where you add the grain and the hot water to make your mash. It's basically a liquid that looks similar to a very watery porridge. Uh, that gets transferred into the brew, the brew kettle after it's been sparged. So sparging is much like when you, when you cook rice, it has to rinse the grain until water runs clear because you want to get rid of the starch. In brewing, you want to keep that starch because that's what you convert to sugar that then converts to alcohol. So it's a really important part of the process. So we sparge. So we put hot water on top of it. And we try to get as much of that starch out. Then we add to the brew kettle. So the brew kettle is the second stage. It's where we take that liquid and break the strains of starches into sugars. Uh, and so we have things that, that our yeast likes to eat. So this is also the step where you add um, uh, things like hops or flavoring agents. Um, so hops can be added at four times now. I used to say three, but it's four times through this process. Uh, you had the first one, which is early edition hops, which is your more traditional like laid back, easygoing sort of hops variety. So, you know, our tall ship would be an early edition hop. It would be very light and easy drinking. Uh, that's where you get the, the least amount of bitterness uh, and your style of hops. So you then you add it later on. It's just like cooking with garlic. Uh, the more you let it boil off, the more heavy tanning it gets. Uh, then you have mid, mid boil. That's where you get your IPAs from. So you get like really sort of like hard hops, uh, so more harsh, more dank, more, more, um, bitter on the back of the tongue. So West Coast IPAs being what you see, like Sierra Nevada in the States, pioneered that method. And then you have also, you have uh, the final edition hops, which is late edition hops, which is the popular thing to do right now. It's super popular. It's where our juicy IPA and little juicy gets its flavor profile from. It's basically just dunking hops in and taking them out. It's really expensive, but it's how you get that like hit of tropical flavors. Uh, and then you have what's called dry hopping which is literally making a tea bag, like a, a shaking a cheesecloth and creating like a tea bag of hops and adding that in and then basically dunking it in and go flip and that's it. Again, super expensive, but it gives you that flavor of how you do things. So the next stage in how you do uh, brewing beer is once that's done boiling, you wanna transfer to the fermenters. But the first thing you have to do when you transfer to the fermenters is you gotta cool that liquid down because you're about to add yeast and yeast doesn't like extreme temperatures. So that blue box over there, that blue box right there, is our cooling unit. So it transfer, heat transfers, so it goes in and cools it down. And then you can put in the fermenters, which is a closed environment to then add your yeast to. Your yeast goes in there at the beginning. And so basically they take those, those starches, we broke down into sugars and make them into alcohol. They're the, they're the people that like to, they're the little, and we use those, those yeast strains 10 times, 10 generations, we find after, 10 generations of yeast, uh, it can get a little funky. So the issue with yeast is just like a human, it can get sick and it doesn't like extreme temperatures. So too hot, it'll get crazy and they'll die and they'll do silly things. 
too cold and it will shut down just like we do in the winter time. We tend to get sluggish, we wanna eat more food and uh, it can get sick. So infection is a big problem with yeast strains. So what we do is we make sure when we're pitching yeast that we close all the windows, lock all the doors and add the yeast because we wanna make sure that anything that's in the air doesn't get wafted into the, into the tank. And infection, our brewers like to say, you get one infection in a in, in your career. Hopefully it's early and you do it once and you learn from it. Because we have to keep this place super clean. We're basically the, the, the slang for brewers is that they're janitors who occasionally brew beer. That's, that's the big thing. So once the yeast has been added to the fermenters, um, it does its thing. It's kept at a constant temperature. The conical shape is so when the yeast shuts down, basically, the yeast drops to the bottom and then we extract the yeast at the bottom. Um, what that's called, and I'll say this very clearly and very sorely, is when it foculates, it drops to the bottom and, and we can extract that yeast for use again. In the middle, you see a filter right there. That's the filter. And so the filter uh, does you know, different things. If you want a crystal clear beer, uh, you have to use a filtration process that you know, goes through many sleeves. Big trend right now is unfiltered beers. Uh, so when it's done fermenting and the yeast has done its thing and it's gone to bed and it's, it's hibernating, uh, we then filter and then we decide how long we're gonna sell the beer for. So the filter is really important for things like tall ship. Uh, our Hoppy Boy Irish Red, you want crystal, crystal clear beer but you don't want it to be too, uh, the more you filter, the more you take flavors out of it. And some breweries actually do a pasteurization process, which is really helpful, but it does take flavors around. We don't do that because just because it extracts the flavor. So the next part is the cellar. Uh, the cellar is this big room here. It has tanks inside. Um, don't really much to see other than a big tank. Uggie's here uh, doing our kegs this morning. Uh, not really much to see in there. It's just basically a big tank inside a fridge. So what happens there is we add CO2 to the beer. Um, so carbonation and things like that happens there. Beer, beer is not ever as carbonated as, as we're used to. So you have to add CO2. It conditions, the longer it sits in there, the better. So Tall Ship sits in there for about a month and that's how you get the crystal clear flavors. But things like hop varietal beers, like our Juicy and Little Juicy, uh, sits in there too, because you want those oils to permeate through the whole entire process. So what am I doing for time here? So I've got 10 minutes in. Uh, so. Um, yeah, that's the brewing process in a nutshell. We do things like kegging here. We are an active brewery um, and you see Uggie's kegging uh, and then you see those casks there. That's another way to enjoy beer. Um, and once that's done, we usually either, we usually bottle or, or, um, or provide it with draft. Bottling line is in our new facility across the street. They're producing there today. Just too much noise to take you folks in there today. But yeah, we do, uh, we do our packaging across the street at our new facility. We do canning across the street at our new facility. But like I said, this is the public facing one. The other thing you can do with beer, which is really neat, and we do a lot of this, is barrel aging. So these are all of our barrels we're currently barrel aging. Uh, and there's issues with that. You can see here, barrels like to seep sugar, and they, they're a living thing. They're, we've got Baltic Porter in this one uh, in 2018. It's doing its thing. These are rum barrels from um, our local uh, ironworks distilling. Then we have Glenora from the Cape Breton. It's got Baltic Porter in there as well from 2019. Uh, Wintervention, which is our chocolate imperial stout. Uh, these are Buffalo Trace barrels. They are bourbon barrels and they're, it's in there doing its thing. It's, it's absorbing all those flavors. Traditionally, you do a, a darker style beer with that because you want those, those big flavors that can absorb even more. So you get molasses and things like that that's going on from the aging of the alcohol that's been in it. So rum barrels are great. Uh, whiskey, bourbon, even tequila. I've seen tequila that's amazing. Um, and so it just gives you that added value to the product. Um, from there, yeah, like I said, uh, our space has been dynamically changing for the last few years. Uh, the expanded space here allows us to do a lot of hospitality things. So traditionally, pre-COVID, we would have you folks come in, do a brewery tour, things like that. We've, host, we've hosted weddings here. We've hosted um, anything and everything you can think of. We've hosted the Canadian Brewing Awards here one year, and we had 250 brewers uh, in the space. Uh, we've hosted concerts. Uh, we hosted um, a tribute night uh, when uh, Gord Downey passed away. We hosted a tribute night. I'll just show you what we did there. So we hosted people 
Let me just flip my camera around. We actually put the band in the brew house, right inside of the brew house, we put a stage there. And so we were really lucky to be part of the Gordian tribute. So here it is here, uh, the label that we had co-designed with a graphic designer uh, over in Dartmouth. We did an event with all these different, and there was live, a live uh, artist doing, so we bought this from the live, the live artist. We've also done other cool things uh, on the marketing side, because I actually do our labels as well. Uh, so we partnered once for a few years to do uh, Star Trek beer with CBS. So a really cool, innovative thing. So those are all the labels we did over the years uh, with the CBS side of things. So really a lot of fun, interesting, interesting thing to do with a larger, like a larger corporation like like CBS and working with them on things like the 50th anniversary. Take advantage of those opportunities when they come along. It's really important uh, to have uh, those kind of opportunities. But we do crazy stuff. We we like to pride ourselves on our brewing side that we have something for everybody. Not all breweries are able to do that because just because of capacity. So we have everything from tall ship, Seaport Blonde that are on the lighter side. And then we have things that are crazy like the Little Juicy or our Pucker Up Kettle Sour um, that is fermented that is fermented with lactobacillic. So how that works is to get a, um, a sour beer is that in the mash ton section, uh, you transfer the, 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 the mash over the brew kettle and then you add lactobacillus. So lactobacillus is the same um, into the brew kettle. You use the same um, bacteria that takes milk and makes yogurt. And so we add that in for 24 and let it sit for 28 to 48 hours, turn the kettle on, uh, and then it literally makes the, um, uh, a sour pH level go on. The kettle turns on, kills off the lactobacillus, and you have nothing but clean, fresh, soured wort that we then transfer into the fermenters. And that's how you make a, a kettle sour beer. So we have a few of those on tap right now. Uh, we have, so our kettle sours that we're offering right now are Pucker Up, Sour to the People, and Little uh, Lucky Punk and Pucker Up Citrus. So, so we, we found a niche with those beers because it's a little different, a little different and the flavor profile stands out a little bit more and so it allows us to do that fun stuff. Um, other things we've done throughout the years that are exciting on the marketing side of things um, is just our backlot bash we've done for five years. We were planning on our, our fifth year this year and COVID happened. So that's a concert we host in support of the Ecology Action Center. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. So we usually take over the Canard Center, bring 4,000 people down, and we raise up to $10,000 for our Ecology Action Center here locally. This space here is a bullfrog powered, so that makes us have a zero impact on the carbon side of the use of our business. So it's really important for us. Environmentalism is something that's really important. Um, and then on the student side, something we just, uh, we acknowledge that uh, on the student side of things this year that study spaces Clean, safe study spaces are really important to folks. So we've actually opened up our brewery space to be, uh, to do that. So you're free to come in, sit down with your group if you need to, groups of 10, of course, uh, and use this space as a study space. We're also offering for students 10% off uh, as a discount for take home products and merch, um, something that we've never done before. All you gotta do is show your student ID and either here or at the Oxford and you get that discount. And another cool thing that's kind of student-y that we're doing this right now is our crappy couch contest. Because I know from being a student not too long ago, but a little bit a while ago, is that you can tend to inherit bad couches in your apartments. Uh, so we're doing, we're giving away a free crappy, crappy couch. You can get all the details. We're giving away a good, a good couch in exchange for your crappy couch. It's basically, you're gonna take photos. It's via Instagram and Facebook. All the details are on our feed uh, and it's a lot of fun. That's awesome. uh, so that's the kind of things we're doing all the time. Do you want to talk a little bit about Garrison's history and like yeah. how it came to be and then maybe a little bit about like your local impact as well? Sure. So how it all started was our founder, Brian Titus, came home from traveling the world with the Navy and he decided he wanted to not do that anymore. So he said, I really want a red beer that I can drink here locally. So we, we started a brewery to make beer he wanted to drink. Um, so our Irish Red is our first beer. We've been around since 97, like I said, uh, up in the, uh, we started in, on Lady Hammond Road, and then we came down here to the seaport before there was anything down here. 
Uh, this place existed when I went to university um, and literally it was down here in amongst container terminals and things like that. This space uh, was used for um, originally for, it was called the immigration annex. So people would come here after they've been cleared in Pier 21, cross over here to get checked for things like polio and uh, other diseases. Then they would stop in this space specifically to get food and the train tracks used to come right out here and they used to hop on the train to go to the rest of the country. Uh, we took over the space, it was pretty derelict, had some furry friends running around inside, but usually uh, we took over the space and it's been, we've, we've changed it a lot since we've been here, but kept the look and feel. Uh, but yeah, we we were one of, we started with a week of each other with Propeller. Uh, before that, it was Granite Brewery, who Kevin Keefe's grandfather of Craft Brewing Revolution 2.1.0 um, here in Nova Scotia. Uh, and we've done, uh, so since then, the, the industry has grown from three craft breweries to being over 60 in Nova Scotia. So things that we've brought along uh, that we're pretty proud of are things like 20 liter kegs. Before we were here, the, the industry didn't have, weren't allowed to bring in 20 liter kegs, which is like pretty much industry standard for a place like Birch and Anchor, who wants to have a wide variety of beer. They don't want 50 liters of that beer, they want 20 liters of that beer so they can bring in new and exciting and keeping it dynamic and different. So we started with that. Uh, we were the first uh, uh, brewery to have put in bottles, a local brewery to put in bottles, and we brought in the Growler program too to Nova Scotia. So, Growlers have come and gone a little bit now. They're not as popular as they used to because that's two liters of beer of the same beer. We still fill them. We still enjoy doing them. I still love taking my growler home, but if, you, if you're not, the idea is that you want to try different beers. It, uh, it's, it's a lot of one beer. So it's great for taking parties and things like that if you want to take one type of beer. Other things that we've innovated in the industry here locally is things like Saturday delivery. Um, keg tracking is another big thing that we started. Because uh, they're they're two hundred fifty dollars a piece of stainless steel that you're assuming is going to go to a customer, and you're assuming that customer is going to take good care of it, and you're going to be able to turn around and go back. That's not always the case. Uh, some customers love to store their empty kegs outside, and once they're outside, they kind of disappear because people use them and uh, replace them with scrap. So, those kind of things. Other things that we've helped the industry come a long way, um, helping other breweries come on board. Um, that's been a huge part of like craft brewing in Nova Scotia is that we don't. Craft breweries don't start, a lot of people ask us, I'll ask me if you can start a craft brewery without anybody knowing in Nova Scotia, no. We're all very much community thing, I'll help each other out. Uh, smaller ones come online in our community and we love helping those out. Uh, in fact, one of the breweries we helped come online, uh, Boxing Rock, actually just made a huge innovation a couple of years ago for uh, checking CO2 levels in your tank. So they had this thing called the FizzWiz uh, that automatically puts via the internet onto your inter on your phone the checking the CO2 levels for your beer. Why is that important? Well, brewers usually have to come in on the weekend. They have to check CO2 levels every day. And so brewers coming in on the weekend don't really want to do that. And so being able to get that information on your phone and say, oh, it's doing fine. It's, it's what we thought it would be. Or, oh my gosh, it's going crazy. Um, the beer's overcarbonated and it's ruined. That's something you want to know as soon as possible. So not having to go in there and check and the fridges breaking and things like that. Um, yeah, it's been... For us in the industry, it's changed a lot since these, but it's all ships rise, really it is. Like um, having multiple craft breweries allows us to have more listings at the NSLC, get our product out to more people. Uh, people are more willing to try. When I started Garrison six years ago, talk of an IPA, I had to explain what a real IPA is. Now I don't have to do that anymore. People know what an India Pale Ale is hoppy and bitter and beautiful and like has those tropical flavors. It's not a, just a clear fizzy liquid. Um, and it's a misnomer that we have here that's not just in our industry, but in a couple other places as well that they, get, they talk about the, the misuse of the term IPA in, in Nova Scotia. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's come a long way, but we have a lot of long ways to go. Like we're, craft brewery exists, craft brewing as a whole industry in Nova Scotia exists as 10% of the total craft beer market in Nova Scotia. Uh, so there's lots of opportunity to take over that other 90% that we're really interested in seeing what those 90% of people for drinking beer or drinking uh, in the industry. So I think that's where the, as an industry as a whole is looking at for summer 2021 is literally like, okay, let's, uh, let's see where those folks are at is if we provide them a product that they enjoy, will they, will they, will they come over to the craft beer side? So yeah. Absolutely. I think this is a good time too to talk about challenges and opportunities that you may be facing right now. 
So COVID, like I said at the beginning, made us change very quickly from being a realtor of, of beer. So our primary customer is the NSLC. Um, they, they pretty much did what they had to do, which was crack down on flow of people through their store. So we saw huge drops within 48 hours of we can watch in real time our sales go through the NSLC. Really good partner with that side of, side of things. But what we saw and we did right away was um, online and home delivery um, helped us hugely. Huge, huge issues come out of that from doing nothing online, selling a few t-shirts to some, some people online that are like first name Garrison or something like that to a, um, to a behemoth of a system that we had no idea. So one of the biggest days, we did a bunch of revenue. We had every single salesperson on the road driving these, these things out. Uh, we also did the beer that we didn't help that we put out a beer called Stay the Blazes Home. So that beer was hugely popular with the premier and helped cross promote. And so we sold that and we made $24,000 for the fee Nova Scotia. That was part of the whole thing was uh, doing something good for the community during this time. So that helped jumpstart our online store. And that's something that's still going really strong even today is our online store presence. Where before, if we were doing market on the marketing side of things, we would never be able to track one thing big on digital advertising is tracking the fulfillment cycle. And before we just put digital advertising out there and we weren't able to track the fulfillment, fulfillment cycle because we weren't selling online. Now we're able to track the fulfillment cycle and I'm able to show my bosses that this stuff works. It's not traditional for us, but it, it works. So we're able to show the complete circle of what, you know, 20 bucks of digital advertising does brings us a hundred dollars worth of revenue based off sales we directly see and the spinoffs of that. So we've been really good at, at pivoting, but at the same time, um, putting up these barriers that you see behind me, uh, making sure our tap rooms are safe, uh, expanding our patios both here and building our patio rapidly at the Oxford was really important. And then engaging those, customers that are really been really loyal and helpful for us so things like the student discount and things like that we want to give back to that community that has saw us through the tough time so the way we do that is things like the Oktoberfest for the licensee side of things and then we do things with the this community up at we know the Oxford's heavily dependent on students and so we really want to thank those folks that come out and support us so we're really excited about those opportunities so it's pivoting I, I know it's a, a very a very popular phrase but saying okay how can we make our space warm and, and inviting, uh, safe, and acknowledge those people who helped us through some of the toughest times? Amazing. Um, so we talked a little bit about your brewing process and how things have mm -hmm. developed and expanded over the years. So how has like the development of like science and technology really impacted you in the tourism industry and as a business? So yeah, doing things like the virtual tour like we're doing today, we wouldn't have even entertained two years ago because it would have been something that, you know, side of the plate. And now we're looking at how we can refine this process uh, and do this even more. Because I think there's a need for people to go out and want to buy a package of beer and experience it together. Um, but even things like social media is huge for, for how we get people out to our breweries when they come off the cruise ships and making people aware. Digital advertising is a huge part of what we're doing. Uh, and investigating for 2021. Um, that's a big part in how we engage folks and being genuine. Uh, you can engage people all you want online. It's social media. It's not just your traditional media. It's a back and forth. Uh, it's not just talking to your customers. It's them talking to you, you listening, and then talking back to them with an answer that's you know, appropriate for them. Um, I think that's a huge, that, that, that I think is any, you talk about the entrepreneurial spirit. I think that's the entrepreneurial spirit in a nutshell is, uh, when we're talking about technology is genuine experience. I find that um, if you don't have a genuine experience, you're not going to get through COVID. I think that people that can see through that and say, okay, you're there just to make some money. Uh, I think people, no, no local person is going to want to go to your business because you're not being genuine. Um, I think like Trevor Point pointed out on it, uh, passion too. Really important part of it. It doesn't matter the technology and the tools you use, but if you don't have passion for what you do, uh, it can show. It shows instantly when I go into places that, have, that, that don't have passion. Don't go back. That's, that's the reality. So uh, for us, the online presence has been really big um, and, and retooling and saying, okay, uh, for my job, uh, for marketing side of things, we do heavily in events uh, over the summer. We think it's like Jazz Fest or Backlot Bash, uh, Pride. It's just about this year is about supporting those local events that need, that might not be able to sell our beer, but we know what? 
uh, in a few years time when everything goes back to normal, it's important for us to support it. That's why when the Wanderers asked us for help this year with things like digital advertising and things like that, uh, we stepped up because we wanted to make sure that that thing lasts into Halifax to 2021. So it was really important. It was really exciting to see the Wanderers go on to be second place. Uh, we wish they were champions, but you know, the second place win was really exciting as well. So yeah. yeah. Amazing. So I guess just my last question would be, what advice do you have for our students? And like, what are you looking for in like hiring employees? So one big thing is, is, is yes, the skill set's important. Uh, I think, you know, from my marketing point of view, I want people that can like wow me, but also not just, um, but come with a bit of passion too. Like it's, it's one thing that I can teach you how to post things on social media. I think I will echo again what Trevor said. I can teach you how to uh, set up a kegerator at an event and activate really crap. But if you just sit back with your arms crossed and sit back and that's how you activate, it, it, it falls flat. No one's, gonna, no one's gonna remember Garrison. No one's gonna remember what we're trying to do, which is you know, go out there in the community, spread the love for craft beer and sell some beer at the same time, but help out the community is, is a key part for us. I think coming in with passion for what you do over and above um, just skill set is really important. Now the skills come with, you know, uh, knowledge is really important for us. So when we're talking about digital advertising, uh, it's a constantly changing world. Uh, the algorithm changes all the time on Instagram and Facebook. Um, so having that kind of knowledge and being able to show uh, and being multidisciplined. Like I think Trevor probably pointed this out too. When I started at Garrison uh, six years ago and I did my first Jazz Fest, it was a big, oh, moment. So, you know, from coming from a more traditional marketing background uh, and working in politics, I thought I was going to be just going to Jazz Fest as like a glad hander and you're like, hey, we're here at the beer sponsor. We're here to drop off some beer and we're done. Uh, whereas Garrison, it was, no, 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 we got to set up all this gear. And oh, wait, by the way, we're changing kegs all night and you're running kegs all around this. this that's, that's where our value add comes. We can't buy out and come with a big uh, check uh, like the big breweries can. We can do things on service delivery that those folks can't. And they don't have the passion for it either. Um, so we're pretty lucky. So that kind of like, flexibility when, I, when you're coming to work is really important. So yeah, you're going to get sticky. You're going to get dirty. We're going to have to wash off the gear when it comes back. But yeah, you still get to play in that social media world too. Uh, but you have to do the, 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 the not fun stuff as well. So I, I find that if you're open to those opportunities when you walk in our door as an employee and not get your nose bent in a joint because yeah, you got to get a hose and you're going to get wet that day. Um, it helps a lot and you'll be able to succeed further into the organization. Like if I would have came in six years ago and said, no, I don't clean, clean I don't clean gear. Uh, I would have quickly found my way out of the organization, not because it's not a nice place to work, but it's a small business and you have to be willing to get your hands dirty when you have to. Uh, I've done everything from uh, changing a car battery when we're on the side of the road to sleeping overnight next to speakers at an event. Um, and you gotta like that, you have to. So you have to be flexible and that's a huge part of, of what we do here is just being willing to accept new 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 experiences and new things and yeah it, it does it does sometimes not be the most glamorous part of the job but it, it it comes with benefits too that's awesome well that's some great advice um thank you so much for doing this your tour was wonderful we love having this and especially learning about the local impact um here for our students so thank you so much justin and no, thank you to Trevor as well all right, so it is 11.29, our tour ends at 11.30, so I just want to send out a quick reminder to our students, um, if you are participating in the Learning Passport program, to please remember to submit your reflection survey within 48 hours on our Moodle page uh, in order to receive your Learning Passport bonus points. All right, thank you again, Justin and Trevor, this was wonderful, and have a great day, everyone. Thank you.